Can we start? Can we start? Sure. Yeah? Sure. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll get started. Uh, we have a very multi-country, somewhat multi-sectoral panel here, and what's not represented in the panel is certainly represented in the audience. I see people who are very much involved in internet governance and enhanced cooperation debates, so this is a very good um, thing for this session. We are going to talk about essentially internet governance, the processes, what good governance is in internet governance. Um, and for that, we have a panel here. I will give a very brief introduction, and of course, they will introduce themselves in any way they wish as we start. Uh, we have Frederico Links on this corner from Namibia with the Action Namibia Coalition, and quite relevant to this is also one of the co-chairs or co-coordinators of the Namibia Internet Governance Forum, which had its first IGF earlier this year very successfully. Um, and then to my left here, we have Arda Gerkens, who is a senator uh, a in addition to her role in running the, I think, the hotline and yes. the helpline uh, for internet-related activities. So quite a strong civil society interest and presence, but also within government. So I think that's an interesting mix. We have Sunil Abraham, who runs the Center for Internet Society from India in Bangalore. Many of you are no stranger. He's no stranger to these fora. He is a thoughtful and provocative thinker about um, what should the internet governance looks like. And he can very well play both sides of these debates uh, most of the time, I have seen. And we have Natasha Tibinyane, from, also from Namibia. Uh, part of the Action Namibia Coalition, and also with Frederico, part of the Namibia IGF chairing and coordination. And we have Gabriel uh, Romotio, tell me? Ramakojo. Ramakojo, I'm really sorry. Gabriel Ramakojo, he was the past president of ISOC, the Gauteng chapter, chapter and was in the national, is in the National Steering Committee for the South Africa IGF. He's also an entrepreneur in his spare time. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Mosanda. Yes, Mosanda. Again, I can't quite get your last name. I'm really sorry. Yusuf Mosanda from Finland. Uh, still a member of the MAG, Yusuf? Yes. And yes. And also affiliated with the foreign ministry, uh, an outgoing member of the MAG. Uh, so, north south presence, both here. And I thought we'll divide this up roughly in terms of the 90 minutes we have into two parts, which is the first part is to address sort of the local internet governance in some of these countries. And please bring in examples from yours about, you know, who are the players? Where do the internet governance policies take, uh, discussions take place? And where are the internet governance related policies made? These might not be the same venues that we think of as the local internet governance fora. What does the IG process look like? How affiliated are you to the UN NRI sort of prescribed processes? What are the pros and cons of that process versus taking some other process? Let's have a discussion. So first I would ask the panelists to give a round of uh, reactions to that and thoughts, and then we will open up. And then in the second half, we will move to international uh, IGF participation. Where are these fora for participation related to international aspects of internet governance? What does enhanced cooperation mean and what should it mean? What are the pros and the cons in terms of how it is currently being debated and framed? So let's start with the local and maybe we will start with Namibia and a few minutes on uh, uh, maybe you know three to five minutes on what that process is, what are the pros and cons of the way you've uh, decided to go about that. Yeah, um, yeah. And in, in, in Namibia, we, I have to admit, we are fairly new to this, uh, to the internet governance space. I mean, um, it's only the, how our IGF came about, the Namibian IGF, the Namibia Internet Governance Forum came about, and the one that we just recently had in September is, is, is from a process that started at SADC level, at Southern African Development Community level, um, where at SADC in, in, in 2014, 
ICT ministers at a meeting um, in Malawi were actually urged um, to go ahead and get the national IGFs off the ground um, to, to initiate processes. Um, and the deadline that was set was uh, June 2015. Um, unfortunate deadline came and went, um, and most of the SADC states hadn't had an IGF by that stage. I think South Africa and Zimbabwe um, were the only ones at that stage that had actually ha held IGFs by the time the deadline came around. Um, so it was after um, it was after this. It was at the end of 20, 2015 towards the beginning of 2016 that um, we were then approached uh, in civil society, myself and Natasha. It was mid-year 2016, actually, um, approached um, to see if, if we can assist um, in uh, getting these processes going, get, getting an IGF, um, getting processes towards actually having an IGF um, um, uh, off the ground. Um, and um, it was then that, uh, I mean, all these processes then led to the 20, to the 27, 28 um, September this year, our two-day IGF in, in, in Namibia. It was a, it was a whole, uh, it was in the one year and a half process that got us going. Um, and, uh, and as I said at the beginning, I mean, we, we, we are fairly new um, to these discussions. Um, even though, I mean, we were at state level, we were part of the, the WSIS um, um, processes um, from the beginning, but we sort of, um, uh, you know, we fell away, um, and uh, these these discussions then didn't you know never trickled through to to sections in society, the, the, the stakeholder sections in society. Um, so I it is only now that we're now that technology and and and, and the internet and 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 ICTs in general are starting to play a much bigger role in in our com commercial in commercial aspects of the Namibian economy, um, and and in society in general that we now are starting to have uh, meaningful discussions, although still very low level, um, uh, they, they are there. Um, and, and now we're, we're starting to, you know, sort of uh, dip our feet into the regulatory. Um, so was this a space to actually debate important issues like the right to access, or was this just like, oh, let's get started and, you know, do something? And what was the government involvement? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, 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 uh, because we come from, the, the Action Coalition is, is a coalition of, of uh, freedom of expression and access to information advocates um, consisting of uh, civil society organizations and, and media organizations. We were in this space um, and, and the, the discussions for us have very much become around freedom of expression and, and access to information, transparency and accountability and these sorts of things. Um, because we, we, we see that these initial um, sort of um, interventions uh, on, on state side, um, from the state side, have tended to be in this realm, in this um, freedom of expression, access to information realm, and and we have had to engage there. So so this is this was the entry point. This is where we are now. Mm. We 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 still have to s actually initiate the meaningful discussions around um, e-commerce, e-government, e-governance, these sorts of things. Um, but, but the government asked you to chair. I mean, it would have been no quite no no natural they didn't for many of our countries to just say yes, we will hold IGF for a government because they like yes, control. Yes. So why was this? I think I mean the 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 it was emphasised from the beginning at SADC level that this needs to be a multi-stakeholder process, and I think that's that's part of the problem why some of the other countries haven't actually gotten off the ground with the IGFs. So uh, at uh, because I think Namibia, the Namibian government is, is, is particularly um, uh, sensitive about its image regionally and, and internationally. So um, it, it, it sort of emphasized that we n this, this needs to be, the, the officials that approach us, it needs to be um, multi-stakeholder, yeah. it needs to reflect that principle. Yeah. So, so they asked us in civil society to, you know, so they, they took those initiating steps, but then they asked us to take this. Got you know it. what, let's, let's get this going. Okay. Let, would like you to be at the forefront of this. Great, thank you. Gabriel, let's move to South Africa. The IG process and ownership has sort of done a tango back and forth with government at certain times. <laughs> Give us an overview. Ah, ah, thanks, Fanat. Um, well, we started our process um, roughly in 2014. Uh, that's when we had our first uh, internet governance forum. But then um, 
we couldn't call it the South African Internet Governance Forum because government was not involved in that process. Uh, then it took it took us uh, two year engagement uh, with government to eventually get government being involved uh, within the, the the South African Internet Governance uh, process. Uh, it was only in 2016. Uh, actually, that's when we had an official South African Internet Governance Forum. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to also to, to understand that uh, with most uh, developing countries, you know, uh, especially in Africa, uh, there is a lack of capacity building when it comes to uh, IG issues. Um, more importantly, from the from the from the government level, uh, and uh, what worked on our side was that uh, we we did report. So we will we, we, we will do uh, an IGF report from a global perspective to a national perspective. Then we we will share that with with our government, and uh, also importantly, what we did as a, as, a, as a way to get the government involved within the the IGF. Or the IG processes is that we will also uh, participate within uh, the the policy processes uh, in the country, and uh, I think that led to to to, to our government uh, really getting to understand that uh, the multi-stakeholder approach is the way to go uh, when you get to engage on issues uh, around uh, around the future of the internet. So. That was only in 2016 when we had the the the, the IGF, but uh, or the South African IGF, but uh, we had two IGFs before that, but we couldn't call them the South African IGF because the government was not involved in them, and they were explicit on that. Mm. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sunil, India is a country which, I mean, I can't find sort of the official Internet Governance Forum for India, and yet there's it's sort of at the cutting edge or the bleeding edge, depending on you know whose perspective of making internet governance related policies and framing some of the global debates. Who are the actors? Why is there no internet governance forum? And do you think we should have one? Um, so I, I don't like uh, the phrase uh, internet governance forum. Uh, and that's because uh, there is no uh, text development or outputs from internet governance forums. So I'd like to uh, call them internet governance learning forums mm -hmm. because all that happens is people come in a non-antagonistic space and they're able to discuss issues and learn, learn from one another. Uh, I think the first only uh, attempt at producing an Indian Internet Governance Learning Forum uh, collapsed because of the weakness of the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, it is very easy for both states and corporations to produce civil society uh, because civil society is cheap to produce. So at this first meeting, uh, civil society was manufactured and uh, as uh, uh, this was uh, exposed, uh, this made it into the media. And then the uh, credibility of that process uh, was badly affected. So this is a fundamental design flaw in the uh, one of the variants of the multi-stakeholder model. I was corrected here yesterday when I referred to it as the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, but we do have uh, one of the variants of the multi-stakeholder model alive and kicking in India, and it is uh, at one of the government entities that is responsible for producing uh, laws, uh, policies, regulations, etc. This is the telecom regulator. Uh, and uh, this particular variant of the multi-stakeholder model, I like to refer to it as the multi-stakeholder uh, consultative model. That means all the stakeholders are only brought to the table uh, for consultation and the government takes the lead in making the decisions. And uh, I believe that is an essential part of uh, internet governance, to have 
some part of uh, policy development led specifically by the government because only governments can temper the power of uh, corp corporations. So why do I think that TRI, uh, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, is the gold standard when it comes to multi-stakeholder consultations? It is because uh, they produce uh, sometimes early white papers, or then after that they follow it up with consultation papers. They open it out for uh, comments. Uh, all stakeholders are uh, uh, asked to produce and submit comments. These comments are then uh, uploaded onto the TRI website, so you know, know exactly what positions various people are taking. And then there is a period for counter comments, and people uh, uh, submit counter comments, uh, responding to the comments of others. Then there are uh, open house uh, uh, discussions, and uh, they don't always, unfortunately, hold those discussions in uh, many Indian cities, but sometimes they do for important uh, policies. And uh, uh, after that, uh, the regulator produces the final regulation or the recommendation for the regulation. And when the regulator does this, they have to give reasons why they have ignored uh, certain comments. They don't do that as comprehensively as they should, but that is the spirit of the uh, process. So you can see here, it's a very carefully thought out uh, process, and uh, it really uh, leads to uh, good uh, lawmaking. Uh, I'm, I'm not in total agreement with the absolute prohibition on zero rating uh, in my country, but uh, uh, civil society, at least across the world, seems to think that this is a very good thing. So you can see that uh, good regulation and very strict network neutrality regulation was also produced. Uh, at uh, the Ministry of uh, Information Electronics Technology, METI, they also follow uh, a similar process, but not all the time. With the encryption policy, they didn't consult anybody, so that was badly done. With the new uh, consultation paper on the data protection law, it is a paper that has got uh, 300 pages, uh, no, 250 pages, more than 600 footnotes, and 200 questions. So if you want to uh, participate in the consultation process and submit your submission, you have to answer 200 questions on data protection. So uh, it's a very rigorous uh, process. And then, very quickly, NCIIPC, the National uh, Crit uh, Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center, is following a very different approach, uh, which is the co-regulatory approach. So they are not uh, producing the consultation papers themselves, but rather they are encouraging various industry sectors to produce self-regulatory norms under their self-regulatory organizations. And uh, the, uh, uh, the NCIIPC hopes to support this process. And uh, once a mature standard has been produced, uh, that will be, uh, will fall into a co-regulatory framework where the ministry will then enforce the very standard that this sector developed upon that standard with the, s the carrots and the sticks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's move to the Netherlands. I find this sort of interesting because we see Netherlands in these debates, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's a sort of a active engagement and yet a non-alignment with necessarily the UN-defined NRI process. Talk us through why that is, who plays, where sort of these debates are housed and where policies are made. Yes, thank you. I find it interesting to hear uh, the other stories because I think there's a, um, a line in there, but let's just uh, tell you how, how we started. Uh, we started uh, at the first IGF the uh, Ministry of the Economical Affairs asked uh, um, a, a platform which we have to, to uh, well, it's, ac it's actually already a multi-stakeholder platform, so it's an organization who uh, builds bridges between private industry, uh, civil society, and, um, and the government. And so the Ministry of Economical Affairs asked them to organize an, uh, an NOIGF, which was in the beginning just a round table with a couple of people talking. But um, I think it was already then that a lot of Dutch people were going to the IGF. 
uh, it wasn't really organized, but in Sharm el Sheikh, uh, suddenly uh, uh, a member of the Ministry of Economic Affairs found out that there were many Dutch people walking around. And um, so they introduced a dinner. Uh, and, and since then, we have at every IGF a dinner where all Dutch people are welcome. And even as for today, I'm, I, I walk around here, I meet people who are not on our list. So we, we, we say, hey, come on, join the WhatsApp group, join us for the dinner so we can meet up. Um, and I think that's a very strong point, is that we also tend to align up with everybody who is here. So uh, the IGF uh, and the annual IGF, which we had, was just in the beginning with uh, a couple of people. We uh, tried uh, hard to to make that group grow, uh, and it has. The annual IGF, the last one, had about uh, 100 visitors, which is quite good. Um, and you can see that a, a private sector is, uh, is, is there, the industry, uh, but also politicians join, and, um, and the ministries also join. Um, What's lacking, I think, is to get those politicians eventually here in, in at the IGF itself. And it's, that's very hard to do. And that's, uh, I think, because there's no decision, real decision making going on here. And they feel that, you know, I'm, I'm a politician myself, so I can say this. Mm -hmm. They want to make statements all the time, right? So and it's very hard to make statements if there's no decision making. Another thing, I think, if I look at the, uh, the way our process goes, um, we are already a, a kind of multi-stakeholder country. I mean, we the Dutch word polder model is 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 been I think an international world word. So we al always uh, tend to um, uh, meet with each other, see how we can improve together. Although I think for civil society, it's it's harder to get a, f a foot down than uh, for industry. Uh, I can say this too because I'm civil civil society. <laughs> Um, and I think if I look at it, uh, and, and this is what I find interesting uh, also with, with your process, if, um, if it's about you know, decision making on economical things, it's quite easy to do. Once it gets to the more um, uh, lawmaking side, uh, uh, especially on privacy, we have big conferences in the Netherlands around cybersecurity, privacy, uh, one conference being done like you know, many times. And and it's and many technical people come there, but uh, we have had laws the last couple of years, uh, cybersecurity laws, which are incredibly stupid and 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 have some you know uh, things in there which are actually harming the internet. And at that point, I sometimes think, well, why don't? How come we didn't get to have that multi-stakeholder approach when this law was made? Because now everybody's objecting. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a referendum about that law. We have a we was have was that about the process of lawmaking in that instance? Yes, okay. I think so. Yeah, I think I think it would have been a good idea if, if multi stakeholder approach would have been there. And like uh, like you said, we also have the online um, um, uh, consulting. It's we, we didn't have the two hundred questions, but of course, you know, this is the kind of process that they call democratic process, where you can say what you think, um, but to really form something uh, as a multi-stakeholder, you should not have that, inter uh, the internet consultation is good, don't get me wrong, but we, you should have the debate, uh, the debate on such a, a topic. And the debate on those topics have not been brought to the NLIGF, and I think because it's too politically sensitive, because, you know, there's, there's also, uh, well, you know, it's, it's about uh, surveillance and stuff like that, and that's always sensitive. But it would have done a, a lot of good if we would have, because I'm, I am convinced if you look at the surveillance uh, question, that everybody wants a safe country and, and everybody knows that you need to somehow find a way to keep your country safe and, and surveillance is a part of that. But to what extent and how uh, how do you keep the privacy from persons, that's something you can talk about. And and the best people who can talk about are, are the people who are daily on the internet. And that unfortunately has not happened yet. I hope we can bring it uh, to that l level now. Uh, as I see the last a couple of years, not only in the Ministry of Economic Affairs, but all foreign affairs. Uh, we have a lot of people from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs walking around here. So the next one is the Ministry of Justice. I hope that uh, we can get them to, to come here and listen to everything that uh, is being said about uh, well, all the things going on in the world. Okay, thank you. You, sir, Finland. Um, you have a process unaffiliated with UN type of processes again somewhat similar what are the motivations 
and the pros and the cons. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, the uh, Finnish Internet Forum, the, the Finnish IGF, was born uh, through the uh, national WISIS coordination process. So already during the, the, the WISIS process, we had an open multi-stakeholder platform to discuss the issues there. And after the WISIS process, the, um, the uh, coordination group decided to continue in the follow-up phase and to meet regularly to discuss Internet governance-related issues. And within that group, <coughs> we realized that we we need to do something to fulfill the commitment of the, of the WISIS outcome document, basically, which encourages governments to, or, or stakeholders to do this uh, fora in, in on national and international level. So um, we uh, came up with the concept of the Finnish Internet Forum. That, that's kind of a sidetrack of the WISIS uh, process, which is, which is still going on, the coordination nationally. It's uh, open to everybody. It's basically the same stakeholders, but it's there are some people who are not so involved in the in the big WISIS picture, but they want to do the national process. So, so um, we kind of concluded that since the Minister for Foreign Affairs, as the uh, coordinator for uh, WISIS, could act as the institutional home and and provide the uh, kind of like the, uh, the the necessary resources. We don't have a budget for that, so it's basically all 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 volunteer contributions based based on uh, in kind support and so on. But we are the ones convening it and making sure that we actually follow the principles of the of, of the idea of it, it not being captured it being open bottom up and so on so um, I think the uh, the relationship of a national IGF to the uh, the global one should be as flexible as possible what you do need is the principles of, of multi-stakeholderism bottom up free to enter and so on mm. um, but otherwise and and of course we do a reporting to be recognized mm. as a as, as a national IGF, but the only thing that, that actually binds us to the, IGF, the, the global IGF process is the reporting. So there we just mm -hmm. consider ourselves to be the national Got IGF, it. and that's the way it should be, as, as, as loose as possible. So, of course, being the uh, foreign ministry supporting the process and, and being the institutional home, it helps to build visibility. Um, in Finland, we are quite lucky that the parliament has a committee for the future which is not a lawmaking body, but it's actually something that is just looking at the future challenges. And they became involved, and they have been providing us in recent years with the, uh, with the facility. So we, we hold the, uh, the annual event at the parliament. We have parliamentarians participating, and uh, that's, that's, that's really been, been great for us in that sense. I think we can open up to questions if... Uh Anyone from the audience wishes to contribute thoughts or ask questions from all panelists or any particular panelists? Yes. <coughs> and please identify yourself and then speak. Thank yes, you. and uh, I'm Ichem from uh, China. Uh, I'm a lecturer in the university teaching media governance and the new media revolution, something like this. Okay, so my question is for the India uh, representative. Representative, actually, you're talking about this uh, consultative, multi-stakeholder model. I found that there's a uh, great similarities between the Chinese model and the India one, because in the policy making process in China, they also have this online consultating process, so you can contribute to your comments and the suggestions. Although we do not need to read the 200, you know, pages, uh, but the thing is, uh, I think uh, the main point is uh, we need to identify how. To what extent those minority group, you know, the civil society, their decision, the, their idea has been taken into account in the decision making, the final decision making process. So you say they have a reasoning and give give the reasons. For example, so I want to know to what extent they actually respond to all this input from the diversity groups. In your case, in Chinese case, they didn't have like any reasoning process. So just say we receive your comments. That's all, you know. Yeah, that's my question. I think it varies um, highly. There is no s standard. It depends from policy to policy. Uh, when it came to the network neutrality debate, there was a very big uh, public campaign with uh, millions of people sending comments. And then it became impossible for the regulator to uh, allow free basics in India. Uh, but I'm, 
uh, quite certain that the second ministry, which is responsible for the surveillance policy, they don't even put that policy out for consultation. So, so it, it's not done homogeneously. And civil society input is not taken on board also in a predictable fashion. And also the reasoning is not always done in a predictable fashion, but it's moving towards that direction. That is, uh, so we're moving in the right direction, but, it's, but at the moment you, you cannot say for sure that just because civil society has sent in a comment, it will definitely be either incorporated or responded to. Yes, Frederick. Uh, in, in, I mean, in our sense, it's the same as the Chinese uh, situation where I think it, it you know, it, it, it is this, um, it is the attempt to, to make it a more democratic, more consultative process. But then uh, what we find is that when, when the comments are received, um, you find in the regulator or the, or the, or the, the, the organization that requested these comments, the, the ministry or so, what now? You know, how do we treat this now? So people actually responded, what happens now? Um, and, and then it becomes for us to also, in civil society, and this is something that we've been sort of hammering on um, once we've sort of encountered this sort of uh, the, the situation where we now have to engage with, with government and, and tell them, okay, so actually this is what a consultative process looks like. Um, okay, so now you've asked for comments. Now it has to go through these various steps it, uh, it, um, and, and then you need to produce a, 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 a another bill uh, a redraft um, that reflects the comments, and then after that you put it out again, and then so so we are also having in this process having to train these officials to sort of or you know sort of pushing them to to do it this way because this will we s tell them this will this will create the best uh, ultimate the best draft at the end of the day, so so it it becomes a. Uh, the consultative process also becomes a sort of a training exercise for us in civil society to say, you know, it, it needs to be act an actual mm -hmm. real um, consultative process. This is, this is what it looks like. So, I mean, the, this question and Sunil's response pulls up on two sort of things about the quantity and the quality of this participation and the public debate, right, the richness. And you were talking about, you know, so this is a bottoms-up process in Namibia where you're talking mm -hmm. about a bill and then taking it through, but then I think, <coughs> has it been a success as far as I know? I mean, it's sort of, can you give a very quick update? Um, well, uh, for the past couple of years in Namibia, we've had a number of um, draft laws um, dealing with um, freedom of expression related issues. Our latest bill that we are engaging on is the electronic transactions and cybercrime bill. Uh, before that, it was the access to information bill, the data protection bill. As Federico mentioned earlier, um, we are very new <laughs> to the internet governance process. Um, we've had the internet for a couple of decades, but it's only over the last two, three years that we began engaging on uh, developing a legal framework, a policy framework, and also engaging in this space. Um, so it differs from... Um, bill to bill and mm -hmm. from issue to issue. Um, our most challenging um, engagement with government thus far has been on the electronic um, transactions and cybercrime bill. The easiest one was the access to information bill. But I think what I want to note is that it's critically important. Namibia's um, context is, is rather unique. We have a very small country. Well, the country is physically huge, but the population, population. is small. Okay. Our sectors are small. So as civil society and as media, we already have an existing healthy democratic relationship with our government. Um, so we know each other. There's my colleague from government, from the ministry. We know each other. We know how we work with each other. We understand how to negotiate our power within whatever space we have. So I think that helps a lot, mm. um, the fact that there's already an existing relationship. Um, so yeah, like I said, we are now engaging on the cybercrime and electronic transactions and cybercrime bill. That's a tough one. Um, and I think our government um, is um, also a couple of, like a month ago, we had the ruling party had its Congress uh, to prepare for our, our upcoming uh, <coughs> elections in 2019. And at that Congress, it was um, recommended by uh, members of the party that we should de um, establish a, 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 a ministry for, for cybersecurity, which is very concerning for us. Um, 
So I think what we need to do as civil society is with that we need to consistently engage with government. We need to remain open, and government needs to do the same. So uh, we can have more questions, but if I were to ask you, I mean, why bother to go to a local IGF is the question. Uh, you know, you call us to groups of people, but sort of this particular policy is stuck. So maybe you have personal relationships and you can move that process. Sunil is saying that there are many other top-down processes in India, right? Which some of which work very well, some which work less well. So why do we care about maybe having another space other than your formulation learning. of learning? learning. Exactly. Yeah. You have active IGF spaces, a platform. What has that given us? Can we achieve these same policy outcomes elsewhere? If we leave the learning, which I think is a valid thing for an IGF as a fora, other objectives can be met elsewhere. Why bother? I'd like a reaction from the panelists. Well, if I start, uh, first of all, uh, the IGFs are very much about capacity building, but they're also about, also about um, um, having this having this dialogue. I'd keep the IGF separate from decision making. That's a way to have a multi-stakeholder discussion to hear the views especially with us doing it at, at the parliament with the parliamentarians and to to kind of like have a have an open discussion with everybody all stakeholders at the table that's that's the key and then uh, then of course the government is very open and and we have decision making processes separate uh, mm -hmm. uh, that that are multi stakeholder more or less but the value of an IGF is to have this multi multifaceted discussion uh, not producing outcomes. So the learning, the framing of debates, and the back yeah. and forth on ideas, yeah. possibly. Okay. And 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 one thing that I'd like to add is that it's um, it hasn't been done on purpose, but uh, we've realised that many of the European IGFs are discussing the same issues. When 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 we do that uh, ob on uh, on a bottom up process, and and we look at what is topical, the European um, IGF uh, Eurodeg has been the dialogue on internet governance mm -hmm. has been has been compiling the topics annually and we realized that we were actually discussing 80 percent the same things in the netherlands in finland sweden norway and so on okay gabriel uh, i think in, in our in our case uh, the igf process has pretty much went to an extent the way it influenced uh, policy formulation you know of uh, in south africa uh, just Recently, last year, uh, there was the a national integrated ICT white paper. And for the first time uh, on that white paper, which is currently now going through the process of uh, legislation, uh, internet governance was mentioned on the white paper, which for us was a, and more on a civil society side, was, was a big win. Uh, because uh, that is something that we've seen started, you know, we've started it from an inception where we wanted government to get involved within the IG, the, the IG processes in the country. And uh, to date, uh, we have the, the government having appointing uh, an entity, which is the domain name regulator in our country to, uh, to to oversee the internet governance processes in South Africa, and uh, and that is pretty much in the white paper, you know, and uh, also having the the government itself within its own department, the Department of Telecommunications, appointing a director uh, to. But is that code for I will take the IGF a little bit more seriously, yeah. uh, in yeah. terms of yeah. okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I uh, I think also you know it goes to an extent where in terms of formulating the, the program and the themes around the national IGF. Because what we have learned is that uh, when we started, we adopted our, our theme and our program based on the global IGF. And we didn't look within the local context and the issues that we need to deal with from the local perspective. But as soon as we started that, uh, things uh, started to change a little bit. <coughs> because uh, we started to formulate our, our, our program around uh, social and economic inclusion, you know, uh, how to use ICT, ICTs to, to harness that. And uh, we also brought more people 
uh, or from you know from the the, the end user side, uh, we <coughs> brought more people from uh, from the marginalized communities to participate within the the IG processes uh, uh, in our own country. So I will say at this at this stage where we are currently right now in South Africa when it comes to IGF, the government is is, is pretty much uh, taking it seriously. Uh, we've seen last year when uh, South Africa hosted the African Internet Governance Forum, and we also saw within the South African Internet Governance Forum last year that we also had the participation of AU, we had the participation of ISO Global, we have participation of uh, of ICANN, you know, uh, and also we had the participation for the first time of our own minister mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the national IGF. And uh, also last year at the Global IGF in Mexico, we had our own minister coming through uh, to give a keynote address. So I think uh, the outcome for us have been positive to an extent that the government has taken the IGF uh, seriously. Okay. Maybe, actually, let's go to Namibia. Uh, if the government is there but not there, why should other people come to IGF? Um, no, our government is there. Um, okay. They are engaging actively. Um, they are part of the working group. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say. Our government is there. Yeah, I mean, I, ju I just like to add to that, but it's not just about the government being there. Mm -hmm. It's it's it, it's become for us where it's a platform where we get to push a model, this multi-stakeholder model, because we want this to become sort of a uh, an accepted uh, practice <coughs> when we're doing legislating on other aspects mm -hmm, as well, mm -hmm. you know, other things. Th th it's just a good way to yeah. approach lawmaking in general. So apart um, from sort of the learning objectives, framing the yeah. debates, it's also sort of experimentation yeah. of, look, a different way of governing things can work, and here let's exactly. demonstrate. Exactly, and, and you, can, you, can, okay. you can take this to other fields as yeah. well. And okay. I'd like the, I, I'm going to support Sunil's uh, learning uh, insertion there in, 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 in the titling, um, uh, because what we've seen in in our coalition as well as the action coalition is we when we when, when we started talking ig um we first had to train people with the organizations and and, and activists within the coalition because th they said you know what <sighs> this, 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 what is this stuff now um uh, and then we have to do training within our coalition we we have to do that training within within government just last month beginning of last month there was this um this 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 workshop on cybersecurity for parliamentarians and uh, I was involved in that, and and this the 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 narrative around the internet was very negative, and it continues to be especially in the older generation. So your parliamentarians tend to be older people, and the narrative was of the internet, the, the the perceptions of the internet was a negative perception. It's a place where threats come from, children are abused, because that that's a sort of information that they've primarily been receiving because they don't personally use the internet. Um, it, I mean, and, and, and the parliamentarian, uh, the deputy speaker of the House at that opportunity, of the National Assembly at that opportunity, asked us very specifically um, when, when, we, when we pointed out, look, um, the internet is not a negative space. Um, negative things happen there. You know, threats come, uh, there are threats there. Um, and, and she asked us, you know what, um, she said straight out, you know what, we do not know these things. Um, mm -hmm. um, we, we don't have the people who give us research mm -hmm. and can break these uh, sophisticated topics down for us and, and give us these, these, um, these bite-sized so uh, information. For so so, so, so now society. we have to now, in, in the beginning of 2018, now we have, we have to do this uh, for, for these parliamentarians um, to understand the issues around cybersecurity yeah. and data protection and these things. So, so it's, it's not just capacity building without... And, and this is where the Internet Governance Forum for us, the Namibian one, is very important. It, it, it bring allows us the opportunity to bring these stakeholders, and some we've not, yeah. we've not approached at this stage, to bring them to this venue, okay. to bring them to this platform, and then just inform them of what's happening locally and what's happening internationally and what's happening regionally. Good. Uh, quick interventions from Ada and Sunil on this. Uh, it fits <laughs> uh, very good with what you're saying, actually. I think one of the, the big reasons why I think politicians should go to uh, this IGF or national IGF is 
it's because of uh, the knowledge and and I, I'd like that word mm. that you wanted to add so it's the learning forum uh, because uh, I think many um, politicians are afraid to also in my country I mean and even if they're not old even if they're you know I'm not old but anyway <laughs> <laughs> if they're a bit younger than I am uh, they still don't know. Uh, they don't know that much of the internet, but they're afraid to to engage because they think it's all technical. They think I cannot know. It's technical. It's very difficult to know. And and what's happening around there? And 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 within the the uh, local IGFs, mm -hmm. if they come, and at least we can try to explain to them what it is, because it's all about common sense. Also, policy making is all about common sense. It's not that difficult. It's not that technical. I mean, you can have the tech to say, yeah, that, that will work, that won't work, and that's just it, you know? But it's not much more about it. So I, I still uh, am really sad that we don't have that many politicians coming here yes. to the International IGF. I basically tell them, because they have all these um, topics that they talk about, uh, whether it's uh, open source, whether it's privacy, whether it's uh, uh, copyright infringement, when it's child sexual abuse, it's all these topics. They're all here. So I tell them, you, you go, you spend one week, and you know everything. I mean, you have you have a new knowledge. You have a basis on what to go on. Fortunately, they haven't done it yet, but this is the reason why they should go, in my opinion. Okay. Sunny. So the problem statement is that the, uh, the government doesn't show up at the IGFs, and perhaps in certain countries they don't show up at the national IGFs, uh, but they used to come to the global IGFs, and at one point when we wanted to give them uh, some more leverage, we had a ministerial uh, component to the IGF, then we changed it from a ministerial to a high-level meeting or something like that. But then uh, civil society, with its uh, kind of naive <laughs> adherence to the multi-stakeholder model, insisted that they want to be in all those rooms. So civil society uh, entered the high-level meeting in Bali, and uh, at the next meeting, uh, governments decided that they don't want to come anymore. This is because our approach uh, if you were to use a telecom metaphor, is time division multiplexing. We choose one venue with a limited number of rooms, and we have a limited number of days, and we have a limited number of slots on the agenda. And then what we do is we put all the stakeholders into each of those slots, and we equally divide the time across all the stakeholders. And the uh, uh, even though Net Munjiao actually produced an outcome, yes. Uh, NetMundia actually followed the same format, but increased the granularity, or reduced the granularity of the time slot. So we have to move, just as telecom technology has moved away from time division multiplexing to frequency division multiplexing, uh, the IGF process also has to move to frequency division multiplexing, where we allow each stakeholder community to sit by themselves, and the governments can say, if the corporations don't self-regulate in this area, we are threatening regulation, and the corporations can come together and develop self-regulatory norms, and civil society can understand their differences and create a scale through which the norms produced both by governments or standards produced by corporations can be judged. Uh, so it's a, we need to fix uh, the format. If we don't, then there is no stake, there is no payoff for government participation. That is why they are not here. Uh, so I blame civil society squarely uh, for the lack of uh, participation of uh, governments in the IG global IGF process. Does anyone have any disagreements with that statement, <laughs> including the panelists? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. No, I, th I, I don't think that's the case, at least not for us. I think that brings added value to the, uh, the discussion. I think, yeah. yes. I think it's critically important um, that every one understands their role in society. Uh, you know, Mavia, we, I hope, we all um, operate from the uh, place that it's a democracy and, and that each stakeholder needs to understand what is your purpose in society. Um, and I think um, it's sometimes difficult uh, for my government <laughs> to accept that they have a very vibrant uh, set of outspoken civil society and media sector. But I think they also appreciate um, 
appreciate that, um, that we have um, a civil society and media sector that is consistently building, um, we consistently are building our cap capacity on, on issues um, that are of relevance and, and, and we hold our government accountable um, if they do not um, act in a way that is in the best interest of our country. So I, for me, it's important that each stakeholder understands their role and if they do not fulfill their mandate, they need to be held accountable. Okay, um, reactions, anybody from the audience? Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Jean Gio, I'm from Brazil. Uh, actually, I have more, more question than uh, reaction to this. Uh, uh, I've been to the uh, national IGFs in Brazil uh, national uh, IGs in Brazil. So, uh, and what I see that is, is there, there, there are a lot open space for civil society there, uh, and the most uh, prominent uh, civil society actors they go up to state form panels, uh, and also for corporations it, uh, it has a, a a good capillarity for big companies as, and, and and I think we can see that kind of in a different dimension here at the IGF, but uh, what I saw there uh, is that there is a lack of space or, or interest from the government and that um, the, uh, the learning capacity, uh, capability that the governments could achieve uh, in the space, uh, it's completely lost. And we then, uh, civil societies and companies, they have to fight uh, for uh, misunderstandings that uh, on, on the Congress. Mm -hmm. So, um, how uh, seeing that uh, the government, the legislators and politicians uh, participate in your national IGFs, uh, how, how do you uh, make this, those space more attractive to governments and uh, so civil society and companies, they don't have to uh, fight again and again and again in Congress okay. and other space? Could Thank we get you. very quick one minute reactions to this because we need to move in a way to the sort of the international participation side, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to respond. It's a part response to yours, but it's, it's also a response to Sunil. Um, and, and, and the thing is, I mean, we have to understand uh, where we come from in, in, in this discussion. I, India has a, has a much more mature IT sector and, and, and is creating, is, 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 a, you know, is, is also a pay setter in this sector. Um, whereas a country like Namibia, where we don't have, uh, you know, um, IT sectors to speak of, um, you know, we, we, we don't create technologies and things like these. So um, it is important for us <laughs> that, uh, you know, government shows up. Um, whereas in, in India, it might be a case where, well, we know what's going on anyway. So we don't actually need to, 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 to be there because um, whatever happens at this, at this platform filters through to <laughs> India. And for us, it's, it's, it's a very different situation where we actually do need you know, not just uh, government, but also civil society and, 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 and our technical sector to actually show up yeah. to platforms like this. Okay, so let's just combine this, which is segmenting into the, segueing into the next segment, which is how do you get government to come to the local one, but how do you also get governments to come here? Reactions, you sir? Uh, yeah, the no. local one. I don't think we in Finland have an issue with that. I, of course, it's... Uh, it's a, it, it's a combination of social, cultural, economic, and all kinds of aspects, but, but uh, we do have uh, quite a, a rich uh, participation from, from the government, from the business, from all stakeholders. Are they here as well, at international? They action? are not here uh, in, in the same extent. <laughs> well, civil society is, but I'm talking about government. Government, government. yeah. Government. Yeah. Okay. You might be government one day, who knows? <laughs> Um, but but you're, open gov to that. you're government. I'm government, yes. Okay. And so we have, uh, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs is here with, uh, I think we have three. Uh, but it, it is a challenge, but it's a question of, of the usage of time and money. Okay, we had a question there. Thank you, I'm, I'm from Guyana. Um, and I just want to connect with what my colleague from Namibia was saying. We're a very small space, small population, big country. Uh, growing ICT space, we don't make anything, we consume everything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a, no a number of po things, a couple of questions for me, does it matter for us, for small states? Like for example, Guyana, we, we have opportunities in LAC, in Latin America, and there immediately there are so many issues, language, culture, I mean, all of that. Um, the Caribbean, even just the travel, um, it's just a massive issue for ordinary people. With respect to government, I mean, I've been following what our minister of 
public tell is doing at the moment. And it just feels overwhelming going to every single thing mm -hmm. with one or two advisors. Um, I don't know if IGF would be one of them. They're not here, of course, um, because it's a small space. So, yeah. so there are lots and lots of issues. And, and for me, the question is, does it matter for small states like ours with, with the resources and the challenges? Um, you want to react to that? Yes. Yes, please. Hi, um, I'm from New Zealand. Um, just a couple of brief comments. I'm here wearing a civil society hat, but in my day job, I'm a government servant, a uh, government employee. So um, I don't see any conflict there. But uh, from a civil society perspective, I'd like to say that we do have an IGF in New Zealand. It's not called an IGF, it's called another by another name, but effectively it acts as a platform for um, multi-stakeholder debates, and it's, it's successful. Uh, second comment is that there's no one-size model that fits everyone. There can't be. Everyone's circumstances are different. Populations are different, as colleagues have said. Travel distances are a big problem. Um, but the, the main consideration is if you insist on, uh, if you develop a model for your IGF, national IGF or equivalent type meeting, if you develop a model where you're expecting governments to turn up and be quizzed on what they plan to do, you'll scare them away. <laughs> Don't expect them to, to, to turn up and, and you know, yeah. have to answer questions. You want to uh, develop a model which is attractive for exchange of opinions. It's not there for policy development. And then you have to decide what do you mean by government? Do you mean officials or do you mean politicians? Officials are always open-minded and happy to exchange opinions, in my experience, but you won't get politicians coming along there. So you can't, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, a, a rigid prescriptive model is just not going to work, mm. you know, yeah. it's unrealistic. Yeah. 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 No, it's not working, no. Because um, I, I agree with you that, you know, politicians, they just want to come and, and make a statement and make sure that they're seen, you know, that that's, that's important for politicians. But there are some other uh, bodies, like uh, the Interparliamentary Union, the IPU, uh, with lots of old politicians, actually. <laughs> uh, but you can see that the IT and, and things that are happening in, in the Internet world is, a, is also a rising debate over there. So it might be really interesting to see if we could just, you know, get some cross contacts because all the knowledge that's been uh, that's w walking around here could we we could share that with the IPU with the conferences there and and there they will debate and share opinions and not come to a conclusion at at one point they just want to first exchange uh, experiences so uh, we come into the international you sort of you know keep moving in and out of the international <coughs> issues so, I mean, this idea that there are these issues that are not just at national level, which are actually across borders, which is quite normal to think of in the Internet governance space, <coughs> and certainly they are being hotly debated in different fora. Here, WIPO, UNCTAD, and various other UN bodies, there are other civil society fora to discuss this. And this wording of what enhanced cooperation means if you look at the tune is sort of the two tracks, one was to create this multi-stakeholder model, fora, whatever that we have now sort of come to in this way, and for a long time kind of ignored what enhanced cooperation means. And now there's a r deep sort of interest in all parties to either define what that means, is that a very UN-led process about solving the governance issues related to the internet, which are inherently cross-border, cross-national? Or is that, again, a multi-stakeholder process? Should it be within the IGF process and fora? Should it be a part but a separate track? Should it be completely a new entity uh, or body that is set up? These are all being hotly debated. And this really has to do with who gets to decide what is the level of governmental participation in matters at an international level that govern the internet, what should be the civil society participation, and where is the fora for this? 
What are the thoughts? I would actually like to start with somewhat government, actually explicitly government people, in terms of what your thoughts are, because certain governments have very strong opinions and they've played at these two extremes of these debates. India has been quite active in some ways. So let's start with Europe. It's a pleasure. <coughs> It's, it's all about, do you want to be effective? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and in the same time, I mean, the most effective would be if you would do it, again, within a multi-stakeholder environment. But I know that governments would be very reluctant to do so because uh, they would feel that it would have been a post upon them. So then a UN process would be a better process. But we all know that those kind of processes are maybe even longer and, and more difficult than a multi-stakeholder approach. I would all be for the multi-stakeholder approach, and if we could, you know, put that together with the UN, we might get somewhere. So where would you do this? Would you then sort of change the nature of the IGF to be slightly more recommendation powers, for example, as opposed to sort of not really coming out with any formal statements? How would multi-stakeholderism be incorporated into this? How yeah. would this merge? I, I personally, I, I'm always have been really uh, for the fact to get some more statements out of the IGF, because uh, that would, I, 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 I truly believe we have a lot of common sense around here, so we can get some common sense statements out of I the IGF too, which would then could uh, merge into the national uh, uh, processes. Uh, it, it could be advices. I mean, it doesn't even have to be binding, but we would, you know, we could advise as an IGF. Of course, we always have the difficulty <coughs> that you have three kind of internet worlds around, like the free and open internet and the, the closed internet and something in between. And you have governments who pick one time to close Twitter and then open it again. And so, and, and it's very hard to see if, if, if it will then fall to the well, the open and free world, of course, which I'm all for. But I think, yeah, it would be best because it would give us more, uh, more body too. It would be, it w it would give more importance to the IGF. IGF itself, okay. And then Peter, yeah. Challenging to be speak before Peter. You may correct <laughs> everything that I. <laughs> 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 you may correct my opinion. First of all, um, I wouldn't change the IGF. It's um, it's very unique. It's, it's dynamic, of course, there's always room for improvement. But we do already have quite a lot of output out of the IGF. Every workshop proposal, a proposer when, when organizing a pr workshop needs to do a report, right? Yeah. Who reads the reports? Probably no one. Where are, they, are they available? I don't know, I'm a MAG member, so I see them, but I'm not uh, even, yeah, even yeah, sure if they are, yeah. are available. Yeah, sure. and, and the way that we built, for example, our national process is that we do a report and we hold our forum before the Eurodig. We feed into the Eurodig, Eurodig feeds into the IGF. In the back now you have the messages from Tallinn or whatever the document is called. So there's a lot of output already. Now on enhanced cooperation, um, it's been going on for 12 years. That's, that's my view. It's happening all the time, it's happening here. IGF might be a little bit of a separate track or it might be a building kind of like this ladder with enhanced cooperation. Um, the topics of the IGF ch have changed a lot. I don't think we would need to change the IGF to serve the, um, the in-house cooperation process anymore. A lot of organizations have developed dis the discussions in, in many organizations. You mentioned WIPO, UNCTAD, WTO, uh, ICANN, so much improvement. So you have to notice that it's, it's basically, it's, it's ongoing and it's going good. Thanks. I'm Peter Major, Vice Chair of the Commission on Science and Technology for Development. I have been chairing the first working group on enhanced cooperation. I've been chairing the working group on, on the improvements to the IGF. Uh, so this is the introduction. Uh, <laughs> the uh, enhanced cooperation. Uh, on the international level, we have a UN document which is called the Tunis Agenda. Uh, in 2015, the UN, UN General Assembly uh, took a resolution which extended the mandate of the RGF by 10 years, and it also called for the work carried out 
by the first working group to be continued in the second working group on enhanced cooperation. Uh, the mandate of the RGF uh, is a non-binding uh, process, a separate process from enhanced cooperation. It has been reinforced in this resolution. It is not producing uh, any resolutions, no recommendations. Uh, it does produce some reports. Uh, it used to produce some 400 or 600 pages of transcripts, uh, which is a very rich source of knowledge. Probably it's not <coughs> very easy to digest. Uh, and I have to tell that uh, all RGFs are extremely rich and they should be used. Now, as for enhanced cooperation, it means that uh, the role of the government in the public policy issues, international public policy issues related to the internet, but not on a day-to-day -day operational basis. As a background, you may know that the private corporation, which is called ICANN, uh, is uh, taking care of the DNS system, that is the domain name system, and this the and the uh, internet protocol numbers. Now, enhanced cooperation was a kind of term which came up in the Tunis uh, phase of the negotiations. Nobody really knows what it means. And it was deliberately a kind of diplomatic uh, ambiguity. Everybody was happy with the term. And uh, that created uh, this kind of uh, processes which we are in the middle of and uh, everybody tries to, to uh, uh, convince uh, the other parties about his uh, convictions. Uh, right now we are at the end of the second working group uh, which is going to have its meeting at the end of January uh, and the basic issue is whether to continue doing nothing uh, or whether we are going to have a kind of consultative meetings within the CSTD or shall we use the IGF as a forum for enhanced cooperation or shall we create a new mechanism. Now in the previous working group we have identified a lot of issues about 200 issues related to enhanced cooperation, and we have identified existing mechanisms uh, in the UN framework and outside the UN framework. We have also identified gaps where some issues are not covered by UN uh, processes, and everybody was equally unhappy, which is a good sign. It is really a good sign because if everybody is unhappy, then uh, probably there's, uh, there's a way to go forward. So uh, right now, we are about to finish our work and we will come up probably with kind of uh, recommendations which will be uh, in the form of options. Uh, it will be taken up by the CSTD, that is the Commission on Science and Technology for Development for discussions, but we have to be uh, really careful about that. Mint Surf in the opening ceremony said that we are just reflecting the real world. So if there are political differences and basic political differences, they are being reflected in our discussions in the RG world, in the internet governance world. So we can't be better, at least. We try to be, but uh, it's not always easy. So getting back to the working group itself and uh, some words and I will stop there. It is a multi-stakeholder working group, which is a big achievement in itself. So within the UN system, you have a working group, which is officially a multi-stakeholder working group made up of 22 member states and 20 representatives of different stakeholders, including civil society, technical community, academia, and international organizations. Uh, personally, I'm very proud of that. It was a big achievement. In the first working group, we have been talking about the participation of other stakeholders as, well, invited members. And this is not the case anymore. They are, they are on equal footing. So they are being recognized and they are not disputed anymore. 
what, what they are doing in the room. And this is something uh, uh, very promising. Now, as for the results, probably we have to be patient and uh, we try to do our best. And I'm, as always, optimistic. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I was in Tunis in 2005 as a New Zealand government representative, and Peter has put it very well. I can't say better than that. Thank you. Um, so my comment now, I'll change what I was going to say and just make a personal comment that there is a, there's an image problem or a marketing problem. We have to persuade um, stakeholders in our various countries that the Internet is not some sort of threatening private space where secret things happen. This is, is, is it, we are, to, again, to quote um, various people who spoke at the plenary, um, we're dealing with real life, we're dealing with all our lives, and we have to explain to people that internet governance is a fact about dealing with the utility that's as common as fresh air and tap water and should be just as clean, in fact. You know? Uh, we need to m promote an understanding in society of the internet as... Um, a normal daily uh, resource and the, the importance of all actors in society taking an interest in how that resource is managed and distributed and, and kept usable. That's all. But it, it, it's a marketing problem, it's pro you know, an, an image problem that we need to tackle somehow. Thanks. Yes, actually, it's for Peter. Uh, because, as you know, China is, Chinese government is very pro, like a multilateral uh, uh, approach in the internet governance. So I'm a bit surprised why the Chinese government didn't involve in this enhanced uh, cooperation working group. Because uh, I, I'll go through the document, the meeting document. Actually, I didn't find, find any input from Chinese government. So I'm just curious to what's the reason. I'm curious too. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Uh, more seriously, I have raised this issue uh, with the appropriate uh, responsible uh, people in China. I was in Wu Chen uh, last two weeks ago, and uh, and but before that, during the visits forum, I also raised the question that if you want to to uh, to influence things, you have to be at least present. So this is the first step, and I think China should be there, uh, considering the 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 uh, leading role China is having right now. So it should be there. I mean, we we can't discuss things, and India is fortunately there. So uh, at least the two big uh, emerging powers are there. So I, I really encourage China, and I think there will be a lot of occasions they could contribute. Well, it's most unfortunate in this working group they are not part of. Thank you. So, Sunil, what has been India's position on this? And you as civil – and there have been very active actors of Indian civil society in this space. Do you agree with them? Um. The trouble is I haven't followed the second working group's uh, pro uh, process closely enough. Uh, I think in the first working group, uh, India gave various proposals, as uh, Peter pointed out, on how enhanced cooperation could be uh, taken forward. There are uh, three different entities in India that participate in global IG processes. Uh, what used to be DATI, or the Department of Information and Electronic Technology, they uh, were the biggest champions of the multi-stakeholder model as understood by uh, what happens at ICANN. Mm. Um, the uh, people who were the least convinced with the multi-stakeholder model and most invested in the multilateral model was the Department <coughs> of Telecom. Uh, quite obviously, because everything they were interested in was happening at the ITU. And uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs 
kind of oscillated between uh, those two positions over the years. So if you looked at some of the contributions at the working group, uh, sometimes you couldn't see a kind of uh, cogent historical uh, thread. Uh, Indian civil society, I think, is also quite active in that uh, working group. Uh, so uh, unless I go through all the documentation of the second working group, I'm unable to answer this is part your, of my question, your, your, your yeah, question. Sorry. I think go, going forward to address the needs of the uh, small island developing countries uh, and other countries that don't have these big budgets to be at all meetings, uh, we need, I think, in my view, the enhanced cooperation to be instantiated in a forum where people, regardless of where they are, whether they are at ISO or ITF or IEEE or uh, WIPO or WTO, they come and report uh, on what is happening in each of these locations and collect feedback so that for a country with limited budget for the foreign ministry, you just go to one meeting and you get the whole s swathe of what is happening uh, globally. And the second thing which enhanced cooperation somehow has to address is the gaps which Peter uh, outlined. So who should take on uh, that uh, role uh, if it is going to be some kind of global institution and whether some of it can be addressed by industry self-regulation. That's the, so industry also should perhaps uh, look at the gaps list as their homework and see whether they can preempt uh, government uh, regulation by self-regulating in a, again, in a consultative fashion. So, um, w when wa some parties call for a UN-like or UN-led process for w the rules that govern the internet across borders, uh, it comes down to sort of the mechanisms they currently have to participate in that process and for who. So, civil society, the argument is that they're traditionally not there because this is the primacy of the member states and many civil society and private sector have been invited as observers, uh, and certainly they're allowed to speak after the nation states speak. So how multi-stakeholder can this be, for example? So you're proposing actually uh, slightly giving a little bit more teeth uh, to the IGF process itself to be somewhat, let's say, recommendatory, instead of just sort of talking and learning to come out with a little bit more concrete outcomes. And what I hear from you, so, is slightly a process-oriented thing, which is sort of there is multi-stakeholderism at the national, let's say in the Euro regional level, and then you could take those into perhaps even the UN process, if that is where we end up in what we mean by enhanced cooperation. So there is multi-stakeholderism bottoms up, but somehow it ends up in a UN-type process. South Africa, Namibia, reactions to this, how do we feel about this? Or do you think the UN should allow all civil society also into this? Or should we create yet another organization? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't think that we need to create a, a, another organization. I mean, one of the reasons why we don't have many African governments or for, you know, a government from developing countries participating in such meeting is because what you, you mentioned in terms of, you know, resources. You know, so if we go ahead, if we go to create another forum, uh, you know, that will just <coughs> not be, uh, I think, uh, uh, a wise move, if I can put it that way. But then going back to your question, uh, I think what Sunil says is very important that uh, probably we need to have a platform that all governments, you know, everyone comes into like once in five years, once in five years, where all these issues are pretty much discussed. So if you, if you look at, uh, at Net Mundial, right, uh, everyone got at, at that meeting with one folk, with one, uh, everyone had a one keep or one say, there's now the, the Queen's language now is running away. but. <laughs> Everyone had one purpose, you know, uh, and that came out from the Snowden revelations. 
All right. And that's when you, you, we were able to see governments from developing countries coming there with one key purpose. And I think if there comes a time again where, or a process like that, you know, and that had tangible outcomes from it. Uh, and I think I always say that uh, uh, the previous, I can see who uh, had a good strategy, you know, which worked, you know, uh, whereby he used that platform to ensure that he pushes the IANA transaction. Okay, because that's where it all started. And I think if we come again to such forums, or maybe you come again to have such forums once in five years, that should be something that will be, you know, uh, you know, that's pretty much my, because, well, maybe last point though is that uh, even with the, this, with the, with the global IGF, I mean, we had this discussion at the academy that what is the legitimacy of, of the Syntax Governance Forum, you know. Um, so do you want to change it? No, I, I don't want to change it. But why, why then, I mean, we, I don't see its legitimacy without the involvement of government. Mm. Okay. You know, but you never question why the private sector is not involved. You never question why <laughs> the technical community in most parts is not involved, but you always question if government is not involved. Howdy, I think you had a reaction to this. Yeah, that's, that's a good point you make, actually. <laughs> that's true. No, I think it, it, I, th I like the idea because um, you're absolutely right. I mean, many uh, this, this is all being report, uh, recorded. We can read the reports. We make conclusions in, in every uh, debate and workshop we have. But it seems to stay within the IGF here. And uh, and I think you could just, you know, make one every five year a, a special IGF, high profile IGF. That would make it even more interesting maybe for uh, policy makers to come. So it could, it could be a nice idea and we could scale that up. You know, we could work on that in the, all the other IGFs and maybe in the same processes as, you know, the local, the regional, and then going up to the, the, the international. So I like the idea. Namibia, any, either of you who wishes to respond? Um, I agree with both um, Gabriel and my sister from, so which country? Netherlands. Netherlands. Um, I do think um, that the IGF needs to, um, needs to have a bit more teeth. Uh, that I'm not saying that they need to pass uh, motions, but to make recommendations to the global community in terms of where we can go. I agree with her 100% that this is an amazing space for knowledge sharing and learning. Uh, but I think that critically important uh, is we need to start at the national IGF level. If, um, if we are not en enhancing our cooperation at national IG level, um, and if we are not supporting each other and um, there's no capacity building and we are not developing a, 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 an environment where innovation and, and freedom of expression and um, technology, all of that is, 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 the environment is not conducive for all of that, then I don't think that as national IGF we will be able to make an impact at regional or global level. Um, and I must say that this is uh, only my second IGF. Um, I went to Mexico last year. This is my second IGF. And it is very obvious to me that this space is a very unequal space. Um, that uh, for civil society, for example, for me as a civil society organization um, from, from the Global South, if I didn't have the support of the IGF Academy, I would never get here. There's no way I would be able to get to Switzerland or to Mexico if I didn't join um, the IGF Academy. Um, and also, I wouldn't have had access to the amazing network that I have access to thanks to the IGF Academy. Um, and that this space is dominated by the global northern governments and the corporations. So um, there's always room for improvement, as you said, and I hope that as, as we as African um, national IGFs uh, are, are getting stronger and the regional IGF will, as a result, I believe, get stronger. And as a result, the African IGF will get stronger. We have to change the narrative of my continent at this rate. We have to. I'm sorry, I'm going to force each of you to respond to my last question, which is, you're not sort of sidestepping. You, this it, you, okay, we should change the IGF. We should have some strong outputs. We should have our relevance. All of these things I hear. So great, who do we give these recommendations to and who should be making the rules? about the international aspects of governing the internet. Do we leave it up to the UN and the ITU 
uh, what, what are your, give me your top two candidates for where rules should be met and why. Privacy, security, stability of the internet, uh, cross-border data flows. You take the top five picks from the panels that are organized here. What is the fora for making these rules? There are existing spaces, some of these are discussed in the UN. So I'm asking about, should we make those rules here? Nobody seems to say that the IGF should stay as is or maybe have a little bit more teeth in making come out, coming out with documents. So where then, if not here, where? Well, I, th I think it really depends on what topic you, you uh, choose on that. I mean, and we know on privacy and security, uh, all governments will make their own laws. Uh, my idea would just be, you know, if we could just give them some guidelines as IGF, you know, if, if you're going to make such a law, please consider this and this and that, you know. That would, that would make maybe m make sure that we get some better laws. If it's about stability on the internet, I think we're doing a pretty good job already. I mean, so I, I, I don't think there should be such a body, one body, who would make rules. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, some of the systems that already exist, these decision-making systems, are really they're good enough. Um, and, 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 and states and, and, and regional sort of uh, associations, they're already doing things. So I, I don't think there's... Um, I, I like the idea of guidance being provided at a, an international level. Um, but I think some power should also, some of the decision-making power should also reside in these regional, su uh, regional bodies such as SADC um, and AU level. Um, and, and, and then, I mean, it, it, it gives us room to, when we get to international level, it gives us room to negotiate, to, you know, to, to work with each other. So I, so I don't think, well, I, I do believe, I haven't, in any way, sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, done a a proper evaluation of why I feel this way, and, and uh, but I do believe that yes, there needs th this platform needs some teeth. It needs to be strengthened in some way. I don't know where exactly, but it does need some strengthening. Thank you. Um, I'm perplexed, to be honest. Um, <laughs> We're talking, we're talking about the communications network that has revolutionized everything and we have a lack of communication in where we are taking decisions on what's happening. It's all there. It's a just a lack of communication. Mm. So uh, it's absurd to be talking about a new body to discuss policy making on the internet as we have everything. We just have to realize it's all happening and we need to be there and we need to contribute and we need to find the information and try to communicate better. Uh, Ned Mundial was mentioned on a couple of occasions. That's an excellent example of a conference where, where at the time when there was a need for a conference like that. An ad hoc conference that came up with an excellent document. And then we follow up with the enhanced cooperation discussion and some of the players there refused to acknowledge that this meeting took place. I mean, please. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, when the time comes where most government they will feel safe to come to uh, uh, spaces like this or forums like this, because in most cases the IGF, well the civil society has used the IGF as a platform to bash on governments. So government, whenever they are in this space, they feel that they are the target, right? So I think to an extent to where uh, civil society and all the stakeholders involved uh, within these processes of this IG, of the IG, they get to, you know, understand and respect each other in terms of their, of their position. I know the IG is all, all about equal, equal footing, but in real world that does not exist, you know, uh, it doesn't, yeah. Yeah, so, so I think um, the, the IGF is fine as it is. I only want to change its name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when it comes to the list of issues, so uh, I want to agree with you, so uh, that uh, enhanced cooperation is already happening. But unfortunately, some of it is happening in secret uh, plurilateral trade agreements. And uh, some of those outputs are not uh, respecting of uh, human rights. And some of the other four are, are not really even doing multi-stakeholder consultation, like uh, 
ITU standards development, we don't even know what is happening there till the standard is finally uh, published. So some of those existing fora need to be fixed. And when it comes to the list of issues that you identified, like uh, data protection, uh, God bless uh, the European Union because uh, through soft power and economic power, uh, the, G the, G the DPD, which precedes the GDPR, already has influenced uh, data protection law in 108 uh, jurisdictions, according to Professor Graham Greenleaf. And uh, hopefully the annual conference of the privacy commissioners and uh, data protection authorities, that could become the place where these regulators <laughs> learn from each other and harmonize, because already there is a kind of standard though some people don't like to accept it, which is the GDPR has become the global standard. For cybersecurity, we shouldn't give up on the UNGGE, even though the fifth uh, meeting did not produce an output. And uh, on cross data flows, I think that also is an issue for uh, the uh, annual conference of the privacy commissioners and DPA. So you are saying there are other fora, okay. We're w about two minutes over time, but since if anybody could stay, we will allow one last question. Okay, um, my name is Maylin Fung. I'm with the People Centered Internet. I wonder about actually looking at the process of how we move forward within the IGFs. And I just want to bring attention and ask if you'd consider the original ideas of Douglas Engelbart, who is this on the first two nodes of the internet with Vince Cerf. And he said we have to work in networked communities that work on an improvement process. And all of that writing is back there at the beginning of the internet that, that we have actually not operationalized some of those uh, concepts. So. Thank you. Um, this is from Chris Prince Udukwu Nojoku. This is a crucial, s crucial session. Government's involvement in IGF is improving in developing countries, including my continent, Africa. More improvement is needed, however. Presently, governments where they are involved believe that they must be at the head of the forum. When they are, which is often the case because they fund activities, they tend to play down on the multi-stakeholder nature and always exert authoritarian rule in IG decision making. In Nigeria, for example, the head of the national IGF has been a government representative who is always the only person reporting for the country in African and global IGF. Nigerian government finds it difficult to allow a national IGF secretariat to be hosted outside the government quarters. How do we handle this sort of scenario? And how do we handle the scenario where government usurps opinion and decisions, looking down on other stakeholders, basically no democracy? Can I ask yes. <laughs> short. V very short, and I'll take also in account what the lady said at the end of the table. Uh, it's not all pol politicians, because I'm very pro multi-stakeholder model. And I think uh, th we are at the beginning of a new era on democracy, on how we look at things. We're struggling with it, but you know, the next generation, or maybe my children's children, uh, they will they will be ruled by the multi-stakeholder model because I think that's the only most democratic model we can have. So, um, yeah, I think we'll get there. We just have to keep on pushing it. Okay. Well, I could easily uh, relate to uh, the situation that my uh, brother from Nigeria uh, mentioned, because uh, we are currently in South Africa now in that position where government has pretty much taken over the IG process. So we now going back where now uh, we are trying now to, as civil society and other stakeholders, trying to get involved within the multi-stakeholder process that we had initiated. So I think how to go about uh, finding, uh, you know, a uh, proper meaningful way to engage government on that is to, you know, uh, build that, I think capacity building is still much needed, you know, uh, for, for government officials when it comes to the internet governance uh, discussions. Yeah. 
Yeah, may I? Yeah, sure. Um, sure. I, uh, I just responding to the brother from Nigeria, uh, we were at the launch of a digital rights in Africa report last year, uh, last night, and it was a uh, launched by Paradigm Initiative, which is a Nigerian um, civil social entrepreneur um, uh, organization focusing on, on digital rights, obviously. And a lot of the speakers and people there were um, Nigerians mm -hmm. from civil society. There was, um, in its unofficial capacity, the spokesperson uh, communications person of the Nigerian um, president. Um, so what, I, what was very obvious to me in that room is that Nigeria, just like the rest of Africa, we're on a new track. But again, as I said earlier, we need to recognize and understand what our role is at an individual level and at the sector level within which you work. If we haven't figured that out, then we won't be able to move further. Um, I'm very positive about the future of Africa. I'm very certain that the internet has changed the tra trajectory of my continent. And we need to use this moment where things are changing um, and to just take us to a different and uh, a better place. I want to also advocate for the use of a multi-stakeholder funding model of the IGF. Um, I must say that the Namibian process is new. We just launched our IGF three months ago. We've only been working on it for the past year. Um, it's been going so well. I'm so proud of the process, so I just hope it's going to continue. Um, but the multi-stakeholder funding model is everybody um, contributed financially to our IGF. The technical community, civil society, government, everybody put a cent or two into the pot, and I think that's important as well. Right. I think we should wrap up. Thank you very much to thank you very much to all the panelists uh, and the audience for questions and active engagement. And I've always wanted to do this in okay. all my panels. We've adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.